December 3rd. So there's a pre-orders are still open for December 3rd for the bake sale, but the uh, orders will close November 27th. Okay, so the closing for the uh, orders uh, will be on the 27th of November will close for December 3rd. So I, was, I always ask for a stat sheet kind of fun. So the grand total for this year was 2,793 cookies, 450 <laughs> sheets of left side. Pretty good. I'm like, is that all? Right? Uh, but I think they finished ahead of schedule this year, right? So that's a good thing. So, what about? Okay, yep. And then also, uh, over there by Cheryl, okay? Cheryl has a sign up sheet for uh, this Wednesday. So, the intent and purpose of the Thanksgiving meal this Wednesday is twofold. Uh, if you find yourself, which does happen, if you find yourself not being able to travel for Thanksgiving for family and friends, then you have a place to come for Thanksgiving. Uh, I know many, many years ago, Serenity and I were in California, you know, it was Thanksgiving time, and uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, we had some family down there, but for whatever reason, we didn't make any connections to do a Thanksgiving. So we went to Boston Market to get a Thanksgiving dinner in a plastic container, <laughs> and we came home on Thanksgiving Day, and we ate our plastic container of turkey and mashed potatoes and stuffing, and we ate it and just kind of like, that's it. That's it. It just it just kind of seemed seemed kind of empty, and so <clears throat> the Thanksgiving dinner here at St. Paul's is to prevent that from happening. So if you're not going anywhere for Thanksgiving Day, come on Wednesday and have your Thanksgiving meal with your church family, which is pretty cool. So thanks to Cheryl and others who are helping with that. Uh, donations are still being received for that, I believe. 
but uh, please sign up so we know how many are coming. Then following the Thanksgiving meal, we'll be going to the church service to have a church service together. Okay, so an evening prayer church service on Wednesday as well. Okay, that makes sense? All right. Good. Um, also, I want to make a mention that the room downstairs, the room downstairs is, for the most part, like 95 to 98 percent finished. So if you get a chance, go down and check it out. It looks wonderful. Uh, it's really neat to see a repurposing of our space down there to make it more efficient and effective. And so that's downstairs, so you can check that out. Also, I want to make a mention to you, you'll notice the bulletin this week is different. Okay, so a couple things with the bulletin I want to mention to you. Number one, we had some um, complications where we're um, asked to be reporting the hymns that we use. So we looked into some software. There's some software out there that does it for us. And so we checked out some software, and then we looked into it. And long story short, uh, we got everything, all the kinks worked out. And in the process of doing it, we had some different ideas as far as making it really easy for Joanna in the office for making the bulletins, but also trying to listen to you, the church, and our previous bulletin, <clears throat> what we found was that everyone liked this tab on the outside. And so I talked to the elders and made a couple different uh, versions of the bulletin. And all the elders were like, nope, we want our tab. And I, I got to confess, personally, I like that tab too as well. Um, but one of the other co uh, uh, concerns was that our other bulletin, you, you'd have the intro on the inside and the prayers and then the, the scriptures on the back that weren't necessarily in order. And the reason why they weren't in order was just because of space. So what's going to happen here with the bulletins, you have two parts. You have this part, which is going to be the tab, and then the announcements. This can be placed, like today I placed it by the upcoming hymn. So this would actually go where the hymns were. And I left this part with Divine Service Setting 3. So we're Divine Service Setting 3 on page 184. So this stuck with page 184 and it kind of followed along. And on the inside of this, you would have your intro it. Uh, we actually printed the collect of the day so that you can actually hear the collect or see the collect. Then we would have all of the scripture readings. And on the very back, on the very back, then we have the prayers of the church. And they're all what? In order. So we're not jumping around. So you just follow the order of that. And that can stay with divine service setting three or whatever the service of the day. That'll save the flow. And then this can actually be placed where the hymns are or in the back of your hymnal. And then you have your tab on the side. That makes sense? Okay. All right. So give it a try. If you have any, oh. it's somebody, uh, somebody, Scott, would you mind working with me? Uh, Please. With me, yeah. Top, 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 bottom up, bottom up. Bottom up, bottom up. Top. Please walk up. Test, test, test. <laughs> test. Test, 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 yeah, there's dust in it. There we go, there we go. No, no, no. No. A little bit, let's try again. Kick it, kick it, kick the, kick the box, yeah. Test. <laughs> test. <laughs> um, test. Test, 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 there you go. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. It has to be dust, it has to be flowers. Yeah. It's not flour. It's not, it's not, it's not powdered sugar from the air. Okay, does that make sense on the bulletins? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have any other feedback, make sure to let me know on that okay, as well. All right, we are um, moving along here. Let's have a quick yep, wait. Oh, yeah, special voters meeting is coming up on December 10th. We need to announce it a couple weeks in advance. There will be votes to vote on the kitchen, improvements. Um, so there's quite a few things on the agenda for the special voters meeting for the kitchen. Everything from countertops to ovens and so forth. And then the altar flooring at the front of the altar. So that's all going to be in one big meeting. And that will be on December 10th to make decisions on the kitchen and the altar. Okay? So I mentioned mention that to you as well. Okay, anything else I need to mention? Okay. Let's have a word of prayer here, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Galatians. We pray that you would abide with us as we study your holy writ. We pray that uh, you would help us as we maneuver the problems of sin and tension in this world with each other. And grant us a spirit of humility and gentleness for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Somebody want to read that nice and loud, please. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, these are very, very applicable verses here for us to consider. Let's go to the very front of our sheet to get us uh, started on here. The stance towards a neighbor's sin. Okay, so this is going to be verse 1. Uh, now, verse 1 AB. Okay, now, when we say AB, uh, sometimes if you have three sections of verse, what we can do to typically number those verses, we'd say Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, a and B, which would be the first two parts, and then C would be what? The latter, latter part of the verse. So we're looking at just the first two parts of verse 1. What is your stance towards sin in the life of another Christian? Should you chase down every single sinning Christian you can find and drop the hammer on them? You know, let them have it by blasting them with the Ten Commandments, and then, as they say, drop your mic and walk away knowing that you've called them out? On the other hand, on the other hand Perhaps you should turn a blind eye to sinning Christians while pretending their sin does not exist. You know, simply sweep them under the rug with their sin. Or maybe you could excuse sin away by making the person a victim and then blame some oppressive system as the cause of the individual's sin. In the meantime, leaving the individual in a poor victim status wallowing in their sin. There's a fourth option, though. You could always go to them and help. Yes, instead of staying at the distance, you could go to the sinning person one-on-one -on -one to restore them with gentleness, Galatians 6.1. So let's pause there and think about that a little bit. Uh, one of the things we want to point out is you, we hear a lot. You know, I'm, I'm a, I have a real strong disdain, uh, actually aggression towards this sentiment in our culture right now. It's, it's Christless, it's rude, um, and it's self-centered, and it's called tolerance. So tolerance is not a biblical concept. It's often portrayed that way, that tolerance is a biblical concept. Uh, the Bible doesn't go the way of tolerance. The Bible goes the way of what? Love. In fact, every time tolerance seems to be mentioned, and I'm thinking more specifically in the book of Revelation, it's talking about the different churches. I believe it's Thyatira, the church of Thyatira. He says, I have this thing against you. I believe it's Thyatira. I have this thing against you that you are tolerating the spirit of Jezebel. In other words, <clears throat> toleration uh, basically leaves a person in their sin. It just says... Uh, live and let live, and just I'm going to let them be over there, and I'm going to tolerate. I'm not going to put up. I'm not. Excuse me. I'm not going to intervene. I'm just going to let them be. And I would say that that in of itself is very unchristian. If you see another Christian caught in sin, as we hear in, Gen in, in Galatians chapter six, we are to what? Go to them to restore them gently. And so this idea of, of tolerance in our culture. Uh, is very, 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 I would say, very, very um, unsympathetic. It'd be like a person stuck in the mud or a person drowning and just say, you know, I'm going to tolerate them. I'm just going to let them be. We Christians don't do that. Uh, in fact, uh, Paul says this in the book of Ephesians. He talks about that we are even times called to speak the truth in love. Okay? So I would say there's two different realms of this. Number one is tolerance, which is just what? Letting the person be. And as a Christian, we don't what? We don't allow sin to capture us and pull us under. Um, I'll just say it this way. If, if, and I've told the elders this before. If the elders see something in me as a pastor that's concerning, uh, their calling as elders is to what? Come to me and to point it out. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be so vulnerable to share this with you guys. Uh, I have a tremendous, tremendous, for these two men in here, Mark and Kim. 
So Mark uh, Bonnie and Kim Philippek, I don't know if you guys don't mind me sharing this, it was a bit of a couple of years ago, it was about a year, year and a half in, uh, it was either Mark or, or Kim, they said, hey Pastor, we want to take you out to lunch. I'm like, okay, uh, all right, and I was like, okay, and so so you choose where you want to eat, I'm like, okay, well at least I got that going, it's like, I got to choose where I want to eat, and we're out, and then I think it was Mark leaned forward, he goes, Pastor, the reason why we're out to eat with you is we need to talk to you about something. And right away, it's like, oh, no. You know? yeah. and, and they proceeded to say, you know, we're watching your hours, and we're watching everything that's going on in this church. And uh, I think it was Kim that said, you know, we're worried about you burning out. And I'm like, yeah. And I said, no. I said, and I, and I, and I pushed back. I said, you know, no, you don't have to worry about me burning out. Mm-hmm. And I remember them both kind of looking at me and said, but you do have to worry about me neglecting my family. So my mom is Carol at church. She's a farm, farm girl. And... Uh, Grandma Carol, everybody knows, she just, what, she just goes full throttle. She's probably watching right now, being like, oh my goodness, Matthew. But she goes full throttle on everything. And she just, uh, she's like the Energizer Bunny with uh, lithium batteries times three. She just goes and goes and goes, and I have that from my mom. And I go and I go and I go, I don't burn out. But I do neglect my family, and I have neglected my family. And so with that conversation with Kim and Mark, they were seeing what, that I was going too much. And then as a result of that conversation, I said, you know what, you guys are right. Thank you. And I recognized it. And then we brainstormed. And as that brainstorm went on, then it developed into what? Let's see if, let's see if we can call Roth out of retirement. <laughs> should have kept brainstorming. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what resulted from that, from those two men and from the elders doing what? Doing their job, being concerned, right? And not just what? Tolerating it, but enacting in what? Moving forward and being faithful as a result of that. And so the point being is this, this tolerance just turns a blind eye to your neighbor. And that is perhaps many times the most unloving thing that we could possibly do to a neighbor is to what? Allow them to sink in their sin. Now keep in mind here, as we look at this, we're going to look at this a little bit more. What does Paul say? He says, friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, uh, the word detected, another way of of, of speaking this word, if a man is overtaken, is another way to translate this, or trapped or caught. The idea, what Paul is hitting here in Galatians 6, is that the sin itself is like a trap or a predator that what pounces upon them, and they're not aware of it. And so we're not talking about um, a willful, uh, long, hard heart of what spitting the face of God and neighbor. It's going along and all of a sudden that sin blindsides you, right? So you understand the word blindside? Imagine being in football, you're just what? You look at the play here and then another player comes out of nowhere on your blind side and hits you and knocks you over. That's the kind of sin that Paul's talking about. He said when that happens with Christians... We who are spiritual, our job is to what? Lovingly run to restore them, to aid them, to help them with that sin. And so again, the most unloving thing we could do is to what? Tolerate. Okay? So we go by the way of love. And love, right? Many times love will speak. And other times love will what? Bear all things. Will what? Perhaps what? Walk alongside of them or allow that event to maybe sting a little bit to bring them to repentance. But the nonetheless, love doesn't turn a blind eye. That makes sense? Okay, so thoughts on that. The stance towards a neighbor's sin. Okay? All right. Is it tempting, though? The easy thing to do is, what, come and drop a mic and then run? It's almost like we take the Ten Commandments. It's like we look at the Ten Commandments and say, hmm, which one do we take? Oh, here's one. And we pull the pin on the Ten Commandment and throw it. And then we run, right? And it blows up. That's not the point. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be fun, right? But, but the Ten Commandments are what? Are to what? Lovingly bring about repentance. Let's pause it real quick as we mention the Ten Commandments. Uh, I cannot stress this enough to our confirmation students, and I think it needs to be repeated here again. When we think of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are intended to protect God's gifts. When I was a kid growing up, I used to think that the Ten Commandments were just ten rules that God had to be a killjoy. To just be a boring God who didn't want to have any fun. That could be further from the truth. The Ten Commandments are good, good ten words. Ten laws that are wonderful. And they're intended to protect 
gifts that God longs to give you to protect those gifts from our old Adam, the devil, and the world. So when God says honor mom and dad, he's protecting the gift of authority because without authority, anarchy ensues. And when anarchy breaks forth, it hurts everyone. God says do not murder because he's protecting the gift of life because without life, there's what bloodshed and murder and that hurts people. Uh, when it comes to the sixth act, thou shalt not commit adultery. God is protecting the gift of marriage and family, okay? God protects the gift of property when he says, do not steal. Do not give a false testimony. God is protecting the gift of a good reputation. And then the ninth and tenth commandment, do not covet. He is doing that in order to protect the gift of contentment. And so God wants us to have the gift of authority, the gift of life, the gift of a good marriage, the gift of property, the gift of a good reputation, and the gift of contentment so that we live quiet, peaceable lives as Christians. And in order to do that, he says what? Don't do these other things because these other things are like a wrench thrown into a, an engine and they destroy things. They destroy what? You and your neighbor and they wreak havoc. So he says, don't do these things. That makes sense? That'd be like a loving parent say, you know what? If you do this, it's going to cause hardship and pain in your life. I don't want you to have hardship and pain. I want you to have calmness and peace and prosperity. So don't do these things. Make sense? Okay. All right, let's turn the sheet here. Let's talk about the spirit of gentleness. The Apostle Paul calls us to restore others with gentleness and compassion. We are to have sympathy towards those caught in sin. Now, this word that's being used is it's to have a spirit of gentleness. More so to think of that word as a word that is what? Absent of anger. Now, here's the point, and I'm very guilty of this myself. If I see somebody sinning, the immediate reaction is not compassion in my heart. My immediate reaction is what? Frustration and anger. Okay? Okay. Uh, so when I encounter, doesn't matter who it is, when somebody what sins or falls short, I'm immediately given to what anger and frustration. This word for gentleness here, of meekness, is a word that contains not having anger towards another. Okay, and that means that you're having compassion towards them in the midst of that. Now, with that in mind. As we understand our own depravity, and we talked about this last week. As we understand our own depravity and just how sin sick we are in our hearts, as we understand that in ourselves, it creates a compassion as we look to others. Because when we look to others, we realize that their offense is the same offense that we too are susceptible of doing. And if not, if we have, otherwise, we're susceptible of doing that same offense, and perhaps we've already done it numerous times ourselves. So then, therefore, that grants to us a spirit of gentleness and compassion with one another. Let me ask you this. What happens when we do not come into tune with our own depravity? If we think we're a little bit special, what does that do with our interactions with other people who sin? We put them off. I mean, if we're saying that we're better than the few, nobody likes that. Yeah. So we put ourselves, the, the, the colloquial term is we put ourselves on a pedestal, yeah. right? Um, Become prideful. Yep, yeah, pride. <laughs> Um, we put ourselves on a, a pedestal, prideful up here, and then we're, we're up here on a high horse, another one, high horse, pedestal, all these things, and we're up here, we're looking down at others and casting judgment. Now, this is that verse that is so abused by our culture. Jesus says, do not be judged, lest ye be judged. And we say, hey, we're not supposed to judge. No, no, what he's saying is what? Don't judge hypocritically. Uh, in fact, take the what? plank out of your own eye so that you can clearly see to take out the speck in your neighbor's eye. And that is called hypocritical judging. It's us when we judge each other on the basis of judging ourselves first. That makes sense? Yes, Mark? I don't remember where I heard this, but it sums up really well my own feelings or my own actions. That is, that I will judge myself by my intentions, but I'm going to judge you by your actions. I know in my heart that I really didn't mean to hurt somebody. So don't judge me on that. Yeah. I saw you hurt somebody, so I'm going to judge you on that. Yeah. 
Don't we do that? Don't we have, I think it's guilty for all of us, we have, we have a harsher judgment on other people than we do ourselves. So we have, like, let's just say a scale of judgment on a scale from 0 to 100, right? And so I know for that, I took that scale, and I'll probably turn it down to what? Maybe, well, I'd say, I'd say about 70% for Matt Richard. But everybody else, it's what? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to say 90. She, you know. <laughs> it's probably, you, you're probably right, Barb. It's probably 100, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but don't we do that? We, we, we have a higher standard of what? Judgment for our neighbors than we do ourselves? Sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, sometimes there's also the reality that we will, we will let the sins of our past or the different things that we perceive as sin eat us alive. And yeah. The forgiveness of Christ too. So I think it, it depends. Yeah. So individuals um, who have maybe come out of maybe an abusive system, whether it's uh, an abusive church, a family, a work environment, whatever it be, whatever it can be, um, many times they have a harsher standard of themselves. In fact, I've said this numerous times in pastoral care. Is this is the eighth commandment? Oftentimes, the eighth commandment, which is putting the best construction on others. We oftentimes will put the absolute worst construction on ourselves. Okay? Now, I'm not saying we excuse sin in ourselves, but there's times where we, in my humble opinion, that we put the best construction on ourselves while still repenting. Okay? That makes sense? Okay? So, anybody else like to crank it up to 100 for other people and go 75 for themselves? Um, Betty and I are well. Yeah. Psychology 101, what you project on other people is the very thing that you are struggling with. Yeah. You see that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Betty is, is spot on on that. Um, typically, that which we struggle with the most in ourselves is what we notice in other people. That makes sense? Okay. So typically, what we struggle with the most in ourselves is what we're in tune to seen in other people because our, our moral conscience is what aware of that sin for ourselves and then we what see it in other people. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's look at the one C. <clears throat> Take care not to be tempted though. This cannot be stressed enough. Christians who overestimate themselves and self exalt their talents are most likely to be overtaken by sin. <laughs> Indeed, Christians who believe the idea that they are holier than thou, holier than other people, live in a delusion. Having the opinion that you and I are something special only confirms our foolishness. Believing that we are better than the rest only reinforces a foolish illusion of our own self-importance. However, when a Christian realizes that, realizes that the sins of their brothers and sisters are a danger to them as well, then they can treat their fallen brothers and sisters with gentleness and kindness while well, seeking to restore them in Christ. Now, this is coming from this verse here where Paul says this, take care that you yourselves are not tempted. So in other words, go and restore your brother or sister who is caught up in a sin, but he says what? Take care, beware, be alert, that you yourselves are not tempted. In other words, when we see a neighbor fall into a sin, when we go to restore them in gentleness, we have to be very, very alert that the very sin that they have fallen into is a sin that we are what? Capable of falling into ourselves. That makes sense? Over the last 20 years, um, I'm going to speak as a pastor, over the last 20 years, um, I've seen 10 to 15 moral failures of pastors. And uh, 10 to 15 moral failures of the pastors. I do commend the Church of Lutheran Brethren for doing this right. Uh, this, they did this very, very well. And I mentioned this before to you, that every time a pastor would morally fail, whether it was with monetary failure, uh, sexual reasons, um, you know, whatever it would be, that when a pastor would fail, the Lutheran Brethren would send out a letter with a red seal on it, and you knew another brother had what? Fallen. And that letter was meant to, what, strike the fear of God and all the pastors that, what, this could happen to you too. But then the letter would go through and talk about the steps that were taken to help restore the fallen pastor, to get him the help that he needed, and then they gave us ways of encouraging, uh, to, to encourage us to, what, pray for him, and then we were encouraged to call the pastor to, what, pronounce the gospel on him because he was forgiven. It was done very, very well. 
done very, very well. And so this idea about taking care of that we're not what tempted ourselves. So thoughts on that, does that make sense? Okay. So when we see the, the uh, uh, on the news, uh, when we see what, a moral failure of, of a person, right? Um, I would say that our first response should not be what? Well, I knew it, I saw that in them, right? Yeah, no, the first response should be what? To sing the Kyrie, Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy on them, Lord have mercy on us, on me, me as well. How does that convey itself as a church if we take on the spirit of the Kyrie with each other? versus the spirit of a Pharisee. How does that affect the church and our interactions with one another? If we have a spirit of the Pharisee versus the spirit of the Kyrie. Children wrong. <laughs> so one of the reactions might be with the spirit of the Kyrie is like, oh, you're just what? You're just excusing sin. No, 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 no. The, the Kyrie weeps over sin. That make sense? You can't have the spirit, the spirit of the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, unless you acknowledge sin itself. So somebody who is quote-unquote antinomian, which comes from the word anti, which means against, nomian, which comes from the Greek word namas, which means anti-law, a person that's anti-law, a, 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 a theological liberal, is not going to weep over sin because there's no sin to begin with. That makes sense? So we want to make sure that on the one side of the ditch, we're not on the high horse, and on the other side of the ditch, we're not, what, denying sin, but that we live the road of the Kyrie, which is confessing our sin, seeing sin in our brothers, singing the Kyrie, restoring each other gently. Do you have a comment? Do you have a comment? Uh, yes, because it's not to one, one mind and the other. Well, <laughs> but I, it's probably... I'm, I'm struggling with the fact that, you know, I look at people as all sinners, yeah. and I'm a sinner. Yeah. So, I, and I I don't look, I, Philip or anybody else, I don't know their individual sin. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, I, how can I restore them if I don't know? Right. And in that but, case, yeah, in that case, in that case, if you, if you don't see a brother common sin, then, then if you, your prayer would be what? Keep keep my, 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 my fellow flock, right? My keep us abiding in your word. Yes. Yep. I, I know that the pastors are more prone to be getting sin because of the, the devil working against them. So I look them up. Yep. Yeah, Barbara brings a good point that if if the devil wants to destroy a church, uh, probably the quickest and easiest way to do that is what? Yeah, yeah, attack the pastor. Because if you dislodge the pastor, it causes what? It, 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 it just, it, you know, I look out in this room and I look at all the interactions that I've had with all of you, all the different interactions. Um, I, I might look at all of you. I've had personal conversations, I think, with every single one of you in here. And we've talked about what we call basement issues, right? And I'm called to take those basement issues, what, to my grave, right? And that's to be confidential. But there's a connection to the pastor, and it's not even me, Matt Richards, to the office, right? In the office of Christ. And so if you dislodge that, it has a way of trickling out. Yep, quite, quite a bit. Yep, so you pray for the pastor to what? Pastors to remain faithful. Okay? Let's talk about this private sins, public sins, and restoration of those trapped. We must keep in mind that the Apostle Paul is not talking about individuals who sin on purpose and work against God's word. Paul is not talking about hardened, wicked people who have spit in the face of the church, rejected God's law, and cursed the name of Christ. You see, as we know from Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, a person who sins, who sins is to be confronted with his sin in a loving, private conversation. If he repents, he is won over. However, if he fails to acknowledge his sin, well, he needs to be talked to, again, in private with a witness, a third-party person. And if there is still no success with the witness, his sin is to be told to the church publicly. And if he continues in his hardness after the church has been told, he is to be treated with firmness and regarded as a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, when people have hardened their hearts and refuse to repent of their sins, the attitude of meekness is no longer applicable. A hardened heart does not need kid gloves 
but the hammer and the thunder of Mount Sinai. Pearls are not to be thrown, thrown to swine. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're seeing here is a couple things. Uh, when we, I'm kind of encapsulating two things here on this point. If a person sins against you, it is your calling, according to Matthew 18, to come talk to them. Um, over the last 20 years, and I, in my early years, I really messed this up a lot as a pastor, is Johnny would come to me and say, Pastor Rich, I need to talk to you. I'm like, yep, what's up? He says, Susie hurt my feelings. And I said, wow, that Susie, she has a way of doing that. And then, and then I'll go talk to her. And then all of a sudden I go and I talk to Susie and what happens? That's called triangulation. And then I get sucked into it. And Susie goes, well, Johnny said this to me. I said, okay, I'll go back to Johnny. I'll go back to Johnny. I'm like, well, Susie says this. Well, she's lying, Pastor. Okay, Susie, he says you're lying. No, he's, he's a poo-poo head. Okay, I'll go back. And, and, and the next thing you know what? The pastor's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he's tied up in the drama, and then it spreads. Uh, and Jesus says what? When a brother sins against you, it's your responsibility to what? Go and talk to them. Okay? And if it doesn't work, then you go and get what? A second person. Okay? Maybe a friend. And then the third is you bring to the church. So forth. But if that person does not repent, they're to be treated like a tax collector and a pagan. They're to be what? Cast out. Okay? Commended to their sins. So those are what we call private sins. Private sins are to be dealt with privately. Right? So if Johnny and Susie have an issue, Johnny and Susie in the spirit of what? Love, gentleness, and being a Christian, they are to talk to each other privately without bringing it to what? The pastor and the elders. Right? It has to be dealt with privately. If it doesn't get reconciled and you have a witness, then it can escalate up to that point. That makes sense? Okay. However, uh, in Galatians 6, Paul is also not talking about public sins. For public sins need to be dealt with publicly for the sake of public good, for public clean conscience. If I stand up here and I publicly sin in this Bible study, you know, let's just say, you know, I won't pick on Barb here. Let's just say, let's just say Barb says something and I get irritated and I and I and I lash out at Barb, right? I lash out at Barb, and then she lashes back. She's like, that fine. Her gloves come off and she what? She takes a swing back at me. And then and then and then the fight's on, right? And then and then and then yeah. <laughs> so if there's a conflict between Barb and I, okay, let's just say, then after the Bible study, I realize, oh, man, I really messed up. And I go to Barb, and I just say, I'm, I'm the one that instigated it. I go to Barb, and I say, hey, Barb, I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? She goes, of course I forgive you, Pastor. I'm like, okay, cool, great. However, that happened what? Publicly. Publicly. So then next Sunday, I would have to what? Okay. Announce to you and apologize to you, saying I had a fight with Barb. And I apologized to her last week, and I'm letting you know that we are reconciled. So then what happens to the public sphere? We're like, okay, things are good. Because if we don't say that, Barb speaks up, and then everybody's going to what? Right? You're going to tense up. Here's round two, right? Here's round two with Barb and Pastor, right? And uh, who's going to win this week, right? So public sins are to be dealt with publicly. Private sins are to be dealt with privately. But we tend to take private sins and we want to make them public. We take public sins and we want to make them private, right? So, as we look here, though, unlike Jesus in Matthew 18, the sin that Paul is referencing is when another Christian is trapped in a sin. Again, we've covered this already. In other words, Paul is talking about another believer who may not necessarily sin against you, but instead is overtaken by a sin. In other words, this is a Christian who may not actually sin against you, but you see them what? Stumbling. You see them in the mud. You see them falling apart. So Paul's talking about another Christian in the church whose passions get the best of them. He's talking about another Christian who's surprised by a sudden temptation or is quickly pulled into deception or error before they're even aware of it. In this case, Paul stresses that you and I should not turn a blind eye, shake our heads with shame, or act as if we're morally superior, but instead humbly and kindly bring our fallen brothers and sisters back to wholeness. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, that is uh, conversations where, I'll give you an example, I've had many of these conversations over the last 20 years, 
somebody comes to me, and, I, and again, this is not, I want to repeat, this is not gossip. When a person comes to me and says, Pastor, I'm worried about Susie. What's going on? Well, she's just been acting this way, this way, this way, this way. Um, I repeat, that is not, it, it could be disguised as gossip, but generally speaking, it's not. I'm wondering how, how can we reach out to her to help her? That's working with a pastor privately to what? Try to figure out how to restore a brother or sister. Okay? The intentions and the motive is what? Redemption. So think of it this way. There, there are two motives that come about. So there is this one, vengeance. What does the word vengeance mean? Yeah, vengeance uh, for a wrong. Okay? Versus redemption from a wrong. You hear the difference? The motive is completely different. Vengeance for a wrong, redemption from a wrong. Here you stand against the brother, the Christian. Here you stand what? With them and for them. Okay? And so if a church is founded upon this, it's going to be countless backbiting, fighting, and so forth. If a church is founded on this, there's going to be compassion. There's going to be what? Now, I'm not talking about emotional, gushy feelings, but it's what? It's pursuing each other to what? Take care of each other in Christ's name. It's this idea that we're in this together. And I truly believe that as a church. We're in this together to our graves. Okay? We're in this together to our graves. The goal is for us to make it to our graves so we're tucked into Jesus to await the resurrection. And if we're in this together to our graves, that doesn't mean we're all going to get along. And it doesn't mean that it's, everything's going to be perfect. But we're in it together for each other for the sake of Christ so that we see each other in glory. It's a whole lot different. So, with coming up, we have a vote on carpet and all that kitchen stuff and all that. And, and seriously, I'm quite serious. That means we can actually have disagreements in churches. I always call them carpet issues. We can have disagreements on all sorts of things. And if we have disagreements, guess what? That's okay. As long as we're always what? For each other, for the sake of what? For the sake of making it to the grave, to the, to the tomb, to what? Our tombstone so that we can abide in Christ. Okay? And so that means we can 100% disagree with each other. 100% disagree with each other. And that's okay on those what we call carpet issues. Right? Okay? It's kind of a relief, huh? Yeah. Good relief. That means I don't have to like Dwayne. Right? <laughs> Which I do, you guys, you know, I like to. So, but no, seriously, you can have disagreements um, on those issues because we're for each other for the sake of what? The grave in Christ. Thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah. You know, when you're having a conflict with Barb, yeah. <laughs> you, you were going to announce it uh, in most of the congregations. I thought you were going to say bar one. <laughs> <laughs> she did. She did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the biggest thing, like, again, is to, to create an atmosphere that sins are what dealt with and reconciled. <laughs> Here's the thing. Every sin, want, we want every single sin that's committed by us in thought, word, and deed to find its end in Christ. I want us to hear that. So, back to Barb. If Barb sins against me, the Bible talks about love covering a multitude of sin. So if Barb sins against me, let's just say, then I can simply say, you know what? She maybe had a bad week. I commend it to you, Jesus. Be with her and give her grace. Create in her a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, and now that shows me I get to what? I get to love her and be there for her. Because she's my sister in Christ. Right? So that I don't even have to talk to her. If, if, and then, in fact, that happens in marriage all the time. Just ask Mrs. Richard how many times she takes it to the house. <laughs> but, but we sin against each other all the time, right? We sin against each other all the time. And if, if we were to go every single sin that we commit, I mean, it, just, it would just be endless. But that's where we chalk it up to the cross of Christ. If we're sin against, say, you know what? They, they, they did not know what they're doing. Uh, forgive them that you do not know what they're doing. Grant me grace to help them because they're in need. 
Right? So we, we, we can do that. But if it doesn't, what if, if it's bothering our conscience where it's keeping us up at night, then we need to go to them so that sin can be reconciled between the two of us and find its way, what, back to the cross, crucified on Christ, and redeemed in Jesus. Right? Redeemed in Jesus. Okay? Time permitting. We've got, this is pretty cool, we've got three minutes. Uh, it says here, examine the word um, bare and fartion. <laughs> It's actually Fartian. Uh, in verse 2 and 5, compare and contrast the definitions of each of these. Also compare the differences between bearing another person's sin and tolerating another person's sin. Okay, so real quick, he says this in verse 2, bear one another's burdens, okay? And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Down in verse 5, he says, for all must carry their own loads. The two different lo words here are this. We are called to bear each other's burdens. The way that that word is used for a burden, to bear a burden, is to help carry a rock that's too big for another person to carry. So imagine, a heavy rock comes down upon me. There's a death in the family, right? There's a health problem, a crisis. Um, there, there's something that is a humongous boulder that comes upon me as a person. If that happens, because we're brothers and sisters in Christ, it is your calling to be there for me, to help me carry that boulder, to get underneath with it. That happens all the time. When somebody loses a loved one, we come together and we what? Do a funeral. We make food for them. We make phone calls. We're there for them, right? Somebody struggling with cancer, we're there for them. That's carrying that burden, something that's really, really big. But then he says here, in verse 5, all must carry their own loads. That word for a load is a, is a word that's used for a ship cargo. In other words, we're all responsible for carrying our own what? Cargo. In other words, there's going to be issues in life that are part of what? Life under the sun. These issues that we all bear, and we're all what? Called to bear those. My old professor used to use this analogy of rocks. And he would talk about rocks in your backpack. We all have metaphoric backpacks, and we all have rocks in our backpack. The rocks are this. We have to work. Put food on the table. We have to get up in the morning. We might have to brush our teeth. Um, we have insurance to pay. We have snow to shovel. We have grass to mow. We have a, maybe a child to take care of. We have a parent to take care of. These are all what? Rocks. There's a bunch of rocks in our backpack, and we all need to what, bear those rocks. Then in life, a big boulder will roll down the hill at time to want to what? Crush us. Cancer. Death. Right? Crisis. Those boulders, we need to be there for each other. My old professor used to say, though, the problem, though, is that many people have their backpacks, and they don't want to carry their rocks. So they take those rocks out of their backpack, and they walk over to somebody else and they would open their backpack and they would slide it in. And they what? They're taking rocks out of the backpack all the time. They're sliding them into other people's backpacks. When that happens, what, what's happening is there's a failure of them to carry their own what? Shipload. When that happens, we uh, have the right to push back and say, that's not my rock. That is your rock, and you need to carry it. Now, if it's a boulder to them, then they need to what? Come out and say, this is a boulder. They need to confess as a boulder. And if they confess as a boulder, then we can help. But you can't say what? I've got it under control. I have no boulders in my life. And then go around taking your rocks out and put them in everybody else's backpack. That makes sense? This is what we do with our children. We have little Martin right here, right? Now, little Martin... Does he have a bunch of rocks in his backpack? No. Mom and dad have what? All those rocks. But as he gets older, the good parents that they already are, with little Martin, they're going to take him what? <clears throat> add little pebbles. As he gets older, more responsibilities. Martin, you have to brush your teeth. I don't want to brush my teeth. You have to brush your teeth. Right? Teaching him how to what? Shower. And then make his bed. All these things. They're what? Adding rocks to that bay because that's part of his what? His, his load that he needs to what carry in this life. Okay? So, 
There are two different words that are used here. Um, I see a difference between those two, two, two words that we bear each other's what? boulders, but we're all, cared to, we're all called to carry our own what? Backpack of rocks. Does that make sense? Right. Do you write those out, those two Greek words? Okay, we'll run along real quick here. So the two words, the fir first word is barre, so it's Um, let's see. <coughs> okay. Bob Ray. Okay. And the other one would be, um, far, far. Fartion. That'd be more of a A song. That'd be more. Fartion and Bob Ray. Okay, I'm not doing like I'm not doing like a uh, fart joke or anything like that. That's actually really it's it's a uh, uh, fa far tion is is actually literally what it is. Okay, okay, and the word um, this one right here is beret. This is going to be what rocks in the backpack, and then no, nope, that's the other way around. This is going to be the boulder. And this is going to be what? Rocks in the backpack. This is verse uh, verse 2, and this is verse 5. Okay? All right, we're all the time. So let's stand and have a word of prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, thanks, everyone.